breaking up is not enough. Flourishing in the Human Space, a podcast by Polly Young Eisendraff and Michael Berger. When you peek into the cosmic unity of existence and feel the love and inspiration of awakening, what happens next? Whether it's through meditation, spiritual practice, near-death experience, ingesting a mind-altering substance, or being born again, you don't get a map for improving your messy life. In this podcast, Holly Young Eisendraff and Michael Berger draw on expertise in science, psychology, adult development, psychedelics, NDEs, dreams, and Buddhist practice in conversations about compassion, resilience, responsibility, kindness, and development after awakening. You will learn how to chart a new path for flourishing in the human space in which waking up is important, but not enough, and growing up is never finished. Co-hosts Polly Young Eisendraff and Michael Berger bring different kinds of expertise. Polly is an author, psychologist, Jungian analyst, longtime Zen practitioner, couple therapist, and founder of Dialogue Therapy and Real Dialogue. Michael Berger is an entrepreneur, an expert in psychedelics, a spiritual practitioner of Jewishness, a skeptic, a Real Dialogue specialist, and a filmmaker who is known for his documentary, Improbable Collapse, The Demolition of Our Republic. Polly and Mike will engage with each other and invite a wide array of guests who are accomplished scientists and seekers whose work lies beyond the hegemony of materialism. In this episode, Polly and Mike talk with Bill Waldron, who is professor of Buddhist studies at Middlebury College, where he teaches Tibetan and Indian Buddhism. Bill has just published a new book, which is an important book on early Buddhism, called Making Sense of Mind Only, Why Yogacara Buddhism Matters. In this incredible conversation, uh, Mike and Polly and Bill give a precise account of how to think about non-conceptual wisdom. That is the wisdom that comes through experience and is not easily conceptualized. Uh, there's a lot of talk these days about non-dual practices and how to make sense of the connection of the self in the world or the subject and object or the perceiver and the perceived. And in this conversation, uh, the three of us get into a view of early Buddhism that fits with contemporary cognitive science, also with real dialogue, and with a deeper understanding of developmental psychology and certain aspects of contemporary physics, which are essentially aligned with the sense that the subject and object are not separated in our perceptions as human beings. I can't recommend this conversation too highly. In many ways, I feel that it's a follow-up for all three of us to the conversations that we've had with Don Hoffman and also to all of our concerns about waking up in a non-dual world. In the history of Western philosophy, there is a back and forth around the issues involving, you know, empiricism or thingness and idealism or mental states. That back and forth is not mirrored in Asia or in any of these traditions that we're talking about right now. And I, I, I think it comes a lot from originally from the Greek idea that you could find a thing that was the fundamental thing, like an atom. You could get to the bottom of the things, then you'd understand uh -huh. what was real. And that that gets built on in the West very much by, I, I'm just going to say it this way, objectifying the world. 
Uh -huh. you know, and then we and then we enter into essentially operating on this objectified world. We're going to extract the goods from it. We're going to use those goods for our purposes. We're going to uh, figure out what's fundamental in that world. You know, through these colliders that's going that are going to go into smaller and smaller spaces and figure out what is the fundamental thing. That that way of seeing, let's say, you know, reality, I reserve the word reality for the phenomenology that whatever phenomenology that any individual has that they consider to be real, like, you know, that's really a problem. Or now you've, you know, you're dealing with the real world, whatever it is that any individual, and that might be the accumulation of wealth or their health or the, the uh, outcome of their children's lives, whatever they consider to be real, ends up you know, being cast typically either objectively or subjectively in the West. So, you know, this idea from Yogacara that there's a different way to cast it. And then from the Buddha, that it's connected, if, that our reality is connected to our intentional actions, that it's not separated from our own actions is very difficult for, I believe, for Westerners to grasp because then they take it right to, well, then we're getting blamed, you know, for what we do. It's either good or bad. It, there's a kind of dualism in the West that's very hard to break down. And I think that's what Mike is, say, is addressing when he's saying something new is happening, you know, even, even in regard to cognitive science, physics, and so on, will I think result in breaking down this strong dualism that in many ways didn't exist in this form in what I'm just going to call in general Asia. You know, I mean, there's dualism there, but it's not, it's not the kind of thing that comes from the Greeks. So what interests me very much in Yogacara is that I believe Yogacara is trying to give us a model that I could call a model of mind. You know, I don't mean it in an idealist way but a model that will help us understand why we have this tendency to make things into things, especially in relation to ourselves, you know, that our body, like my body and my identity and so on, why we tend to do that, the self organization, and then also some, and this I don't know so clearly, but some way in which we begin to consider that our actions are really the drivers rather than these things. You know, that the way that I act with you, the way I speak with you, my kindness, my interest, my compassion, or, you know, my desire to protect myself, promote myself, these things are the more important things to pay attention to rather than, you know, whether I have a gluten-free diet. But that is, I think that is where Yogacara mm -hmm. does add something. So I'd like you to kind of a, a big ask, but you're entering mm -hmm. into a longer conversation that Mike and I have been having with other people. Yeah. Too. So, yeah. yeah. So one, certainly one of the ways of overcoming this sort of obsession with objectivity is to recognize how much we do experience things differently, just like what, what we've been talking about and how much how we experience things is a function of our faculties, our bodies, our personal experience, our cultural and social identities, et cetera, which are radically disparate from each other, like the example of the song uh, demonstrates. So this is a corrective towards the idea that we really have this purely objective knowledge. And we see this with Thomas Kuhn, for example, or you know, quite some time ago. But in all these other types of, we can call them deconstruction, the, the theories of deconstruction. These are correctives to a one-sided objectivity, but what the history of Indian Buddhism would suggest, and particularly sort of within early Mahayana, is that you don't want you to turn your corrective uh, into an ontological statement. And so, oh, objectivity is, is you know, one-sided, so therefore subjectivity is the answer. If it's a corrective, then what the Buddhists are saying, I mean, Yogacarans, and calling back upon what the Buddha taught in Dependent Arising, is that things are patterns in interaction. It's nearly purely subjective nor purely objective. And these patterns are help to make up the, the schemas 
of, in our bodies, in our brains, in our, in, in our cultures, in our language, et cetera. And these are all collectively constructed. And I think this is the really important point that's going on about sort of past deconstruction is the recognition of the ongoing reconstruction of our lives together but with an intentionality and not a naivety. And this we see completely in the, the relation, the kind of the relation between early Mahayana and the notion of emptiness and what the Yogacharans are saying is that, yes, we can analyze things and say, see, they're empty of essence. Why do we keep imputing essence? Why do we reify things? We have to look at our cognitive processes to understand why we reify things. But that doesn't mean that the entire quote unquote, objective world is constructed by mind, our modes of knowing are influenced by mind. And we can't, this is what Michael was saying before, we cannot get outside of our modes of knowing ordinarily. It is very, very difficult to get outside of that unless you're a Buddha and you can see reality, you know, completely and objectively. The rest of us are caught, not just in our own individual subjectivity, but in our intersubjectivity. So the worlds that we are living in, the worlds that we construct are intersubjective worlds, and we can't ordinarily get outside of that. And I do think that that these various disciplines and philosophical traditions in the last, you know, 80 years or so are moving towards that exactly, that we are co-producers of our worlds together, and we better damn well get it right there's not going to be, you know, uh, easy to live on this planet. So it's not going to be, it, that really is a human issue there. It's not a zebra. You know, it's the human that's constructing through language and through, you know, all of our ways of interacting with our environment, which do, do objectify it uh, often. But one thing I wanted to, to continue to ask you there is about karma in relation to this uh -huh. We talked a little bit about the whole issue with Claudine Gay at Harvard, and I'm very interested in uh, some of the issues that are going on in colleges and universities. And of course, you you teach at Middlebury College, and the, with the idea that since postmodernism reveals that many of our traditions in the West have been constructed around colonialism and power and hierarchy, I believe that that the legacy of that in some and maybe most more elite colleges and universities has been the idea that that if it's built for example on colonialism and slavery we need to take it down before we build up something else in other words we can you know say okay let's work on something new but it's almost like if it's built on rot you know you have to take the whole building down so you have to destroy in order to revise. And so in a way, I think that's an extreme, not idealism, but a certain kind of extreme subject object dualism. It's like, if we tear down Middlebury College, uh -huh. that, that'll be okay. Cause then we can just build something up again. There's this big split between the idea that Middlebury College exists in an intersubjective way that will destroy us as well if we were to destroy it. It's not like a thing out there that we just destroy, then we can build up a thing that's pure, that doesn't have colonialism in it, so to speak. That there, There's like a mistake that has occurred as a result of some of these deconstructive systems and philosophies that weirdly sort of separate the individual or individual desires from the environment, you know, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm articulating this really clearly, but I was talking to somebody who's at Harvard Divinity School recently about what is happening at Harvard. And there are a number of people that basically say it would be okay to tear Harvard down because it's really based, you know, it's rooted yeah. in a lot of colonialism, yeah. but, but there's no recognition then that you're tearing yourself down, that you're, you're, it's not a thing. You know, so some of this deconstructive philosophy, some of this movement towards deconstruction in the West doesn't have an ethic. It doesn't have any strong ethical foundation like Buddhism has. Buddhism is in certain ways a deconstructive philosophy, but under that is the, is the ethic that our actions matter all the time, all the time. You know, there, it's not like you, could, you have throwaway actions, so you could just destroy something and a bunch of people, and that wouldn't count. You know, and again, thinking about 
Gaza, you can think about that in the in this moment too. So I wonder if you could kind of bring in the issue of the underlying ethic that is involved in the deconstructive, let's say, movement of Yogacara, you know, that it's not, it's not like a freebie, you know, that you could just, you could just do anything you want and, and you can try to rearrange the universe to your own sort of identity. So, you know, do you see what I'm getting at? The deconstructive philosophies in the West in this recent period of time, at least some of them have led towards a kind of nihilism. I don't even think it's nihilism. I think it's just a mistake of thinking the subject and the object are separated. Yeah, there are a lot of there are a lot of topics that you brought up. One one way to think about it, there's a couple of things I have, you know, and I I sort of have to apologize if I just sort of turn on my professor hat and start lecturing. It's just such a mode for me. It's a habit. <laughs> That's okay. Um, you know, absolutism and nihilism are the, are two extremes. And and the Buddha talked about this and the Madhyamaka, the middle way school focuses on this a lot, but it's part of, you know, all Buddhist traditions is the app is the extreme of absolutism that things have some unchanging essence or meaning, some irreducible something, and then non non existence of nihilism that there is no truth, no understanding of reality, uh, that things do not exist, and this is sort of the flip side you could say of 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 absolutism and a, a very very common misinterpretation of the notion of emptiness because emptiness is famously equated with dependent arising so the extremes of of absolutism and nihilism or eternalism and nihilism are they would say they're kind of two sides of the same coin you think you can get rid of everything just by destroying it and what the buddhists would say what we have instead are interdependent processes that have continuity over time that are built up. And so that's neither absolutism nor lack of continuity, nor what the, how the Buddhists would define nihilism. In fact, uchedavada is the, is the term in Sanskrit. And it means those who think that things can be ultimately cut off, that there is actually non-continuity of the results of our behavior. That's how they define, not one way they define nihilism, not just non-existence. And I think this gets exactly to what you were talking about, is if these are the structures that we live in that have been built up over time, we think we can just somehow get rid of them as if there's going to be a break in consequences of our actions. This is one of the reasons why revolutions almost always are typical failures at many levels, not all levels, but many levels, is because there is continuity of ways of thinking. There's continuity of you know, that's an objective world that we can treat and manipulate and treat as resources. We can manipulate human beings and exploit them by the millions and millions. And I would think, you know, that we're talking sort of meta history here. We are stuck in the moment of deconstruction. And the early Mahayanists had this all figured out, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, they say, first, there is a dharma. And that means first, there's sort of the objective world that we imagine. Uh, exists independently, and then we deconstruct that and recognize it's not what it appears to be. And that's a very, very important insight, and it's a very, very powerful insight, and needs to be cultivated and developed to as large a degree as we can. But the purpose of that, the larger Mahayana framework, is to say, therefore, if there are no essences, what there are, independent essences of subject or object, what there are, are interdependent processes that occur over time, build up structures, structures collapse, more structures get built up, etc. So after the deconstruction is the affirmation of the conventional. This is standard Mahayana, this isn't just Yogacara. The affirmation of the, the customs, the rules, the language, the things that we need in order to help each other become liberated. And that would include institutions <laughs> and that of all kinds, right? Institutions are really, really useful. There's no essence to colonialism, right? And there's no essence to Europeans, right? There's no essence to Western or Asian or any of this stuff. We're just all in this mess together. And we need to recognize sort of how these structures came about and recognize them very, very clearly and directly without, you know, hesitation, without fear or favor. That's what the lawyers like to say. And, and then, you know, build our worlds together. And that means all of us together. It, it's not, you, you don't get a chance to start all over. That's nihilism. That's the imagining that, you know, oh, if we just, you know, I wouldn't have these back problems or these knee problems if, if just evolution had worked differently, you know? I mean, we have all these problems because we can't start all over. <laughs> 
you know, I, I just want to see if I get where where we are in this example. So in one sense, it can be viewed as if we're mistaking the 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 current institution and tearing it down as opposed to actually uh, addressing the root cause. We're, we're mistaking the apparent structure that may have been the product of all these other root causes. And in essence, mistaking if we tear it down, how is that addressing the root cause? Because the root cause is still in motion. It's still a process that even if you tear down the institution, as you point out in a revolution, one could argue in many revolutions, what follows is worse than what we tore down. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Uh, and that very, very succinctly put also, you know, these institutions are products of our previous behavior of deeper causes of aggression, of greed, of, of ignorance, imagining that the world is these billiard balls bouncing off of each other, etc. And that's not if we don't get at the root causes, we just build up new institutions that are still going to exploit people and treat them as resources. We see this in every communist revolution, for example. And I'm, I'm not saying everything they've done is bad. They've done a lot of good things with education, health care, and, and, and land reform, especially in China. But yes, that's exactly right. And then the karma that uh -huh. they're generating in attacking the institution is yeah. also going to promulgate into the future and shape what they may think they're replacing and how it would be different, but then you're just generating new causes that will flow through time and and essentially rot the foundation of the thing you just tore down and built a new rotting foundation because you didn't really address the root causes, as you're pointing out, greed, dominance, basically characteristics or qualities within worldviews and how we view each other and then perpetuate that through our actions over time. Yeah, exactly. And the more that we want to focus on enemies as specific loci of evil, the more we are invited to reify them into certain kinds of beings that have, have unchanging characteristics, and therefore it's okay to kill them because they're never going to change. You know, they killed, if I may, I may, you know, they killed 30 million landlords in the landlord class and in, in, in during the, the once the Chinese communists sort of gained, gained control of things because they didn't think people can change. And so you just have to get rid of the stuff. And this is this is sort of like imagine we can get rid of the consequences of our actions. So what it boils down to is also the recognition that I can change. I mean, there's there's a kind of, let's say, threshold for understanding how people can change by changing their views, their minds, or their intentions. You know, it's like, because again, I was looking at some of the questions that I wanted to ask about the theory of mind in Yogacara, the Ali of Vijnana, but this uh, general sense that people come up with, especially in regard to enemies, polarization, projective identification is you are the problem and it's your characteristics it's your personality it's your desires and those are projected from the self you know that it's they're based on my observations so i hear the word cloud and i assume i'm correct and then i make a theory about you based on the way i heard it and then i then i reify you into my enemy and of course this happens on an everyday basis it's not simply you know these huge cultural movements that become extremely destructive or our current movements in colleges and universities that can also be extremely destructive but you know in everyday relationships with our partners and our siblings we tend to reify our enemies into you are this kind of person and i think that until until an individual recognizes that that's in their own perceptions you know it's like i have to realize that's me looking at you it's not you that whole configuration is very hard to figure out very hard to figure out and i do think yogachara contributes something in the theory of mind and you know I'd, I'd like you to to talk a little bit about this home consciousness or you know what typically in the west is called the unconscious yeah, <laughs> but it yeah. is it is conscious as it relates also to our predispositions our actions, you know, the way that we sort of naturally intend things to be. 
So one of the other thrusts of, of yoga chara as it's sort of responding to earlier forms of Mahayana and, and the teaching of emptiness, and this is sort of its historical kind of context here, is uh, why do we keep, if if the logical analyses of why things don't have essences are so so good, so persuasive, why do we keep reifying things? And so the question then falls back onto processes of mind. What is it that is going on in our various pro cognitive and affective processes that invite us to reify. And this is built up then upon the ideas and the modes of analysis that we see in early Buddhism, dependent arising of awareness, and that we see more developed in the schools a little bit preceding Mahayana, called one called Abhidharma, this process. But the Yogacharans are recognizing that these processes of awareness, and we could say processes of projection, and reification are mostly occurring non-consciously. We don't recognize them for what they are. We've been socialized, we've been acculturated, we've developed into a kind of an intuitive, natural, or sort of naive realism. And so we just think of the world as being really what it is. And we need to function in, in that way for a, you know, a good part of our lives, not just as children, but even you know, walking down the street and stuff. But we also need to recognize what a construction it is. And it's a construction that is, like you said, a lot of projection going on, a lot of dispositions to experience and interpret and to see things in certain kinds of ways. And that has a, a, a species specific dimension to it. That is as human beings and human faculties and yoga charns talk a lot about that. We have the kinds of bodies and faculties that we have because of our previous actions, our previous karma, but it also this sort of non-conscious mode of engaging in the world, it is not just personal and, and faculty has to do with our faculties, like whether or not I have a headache right now, you won't be able to know. But the categories, the classifications, the modes of behavior, the patterns that we grow up with, with our significant others, our caregivers, our neighbors, our cultures, our education, etc. The Yogacharan tradition with the, under the sort of rubric of this notion of storehouse consciousness uh, articulated very clearly that the way that we experience the world is not only mostly non-conscious in, in, in terms of the, our basic cognitive processes, but it's very, very largely collective or intersubjective. And they focus a lot on language, but not only on language, but the, the, the structure, the unconscious, if we could call it that, one of their insights is, and this is, you know, language I'm borrowing from 20th century, but from Freud, in fact, one of their main insights is the unconscious is structured. It's structured with names and classifications and, and proliferations and projections and common expressions. And, you know, it isn't just some blank slate. And they said they have this, all these terms of this, it's this, it's this, it's this and that. And we don't even see that we're doing engaged in interpreting the world moment to moment to moment to moment, just like that all the time. And what we're really doing is encouraging our own collective illusions about reality and telling everybody, oh, this is true. You know, my culture is true and my society is true and my political views are true. And, and that way we build up these collective worlds. And one of the important, one of the most important purposes of this notion of mind only is a corrective towards that assumption that, that what we see is what is there. We should say, we let's like what you just said, that it's only a function of our projections. It's just a, an appearance. It's, it's only an awareness of what's going on. It's not what is truly there. That's a corrective insight. It's not a statement about what reality is. It's a corrective insight because we're so caught up with our own prejudices and presuppositions, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this term, alea vignana, as, a, as two, two, two words that are put together, is also one of the distinctive ideas in, in Yogacara. And vignana, the second part, is typically translated as awareness. We see it's a term that is, is used in the early teachings of the Buddha, but also in all other Hindu, other religious contexts, both religious and non-religious. So it's often, often the, the idea of awareness or consciousness. It is the unbroken stream of consciousness, vijnana, that, that travels from one lifetime to the next in traditional Buddhist teachings. And this is not just Yogacara. This you see in early Buddhism. So vijnana is a sort of stream of consciousness. And the metaphor for stream is really important because it's something that's kind of constantly changing, like streams are, but it's unbroken over many lifetimes. So it's very 
closely associated with karma and the potentiality for karma to come into fruition. It's also used for the kind of moment to moment awareness of objects, thoughts, sensations, et cetera. And so it, it has really two different functions in, in early Buddhism. One is to talk about continuity from one life to the next with karma. And the other function or the other context in which it's really important is understanding moment to moment perceptual uh, processes. And those two don't really fit together, those two dimensions, temporal dimensions in, in early Buddhism and what precedes Yogacara, they don't, they're not in systematized, so to speak. So one of the things that, that the Yogacharans are saying is that in order to even make sense of moment to moment perceptions, conscious perceptions, we have to recognize there are all these other underlying schemas, cognitive schemas that are occurring that have been built up over time. And that are at the moment allowing us to understand, you know, complex things like uh, language without having to think about syntax or morphology and all of that. And the same thing with walking down the street. We don't have to think about how visual processes, a, a visual a, a input is, is processed. It's just going on all of the time. And uh, so alia is this the second component of this term. And that has a, a sense of sort of home base it, it has a several kind of connotations one is is home or base something a, a repository a storage and the other is clinging it's and it's used just by itself to referring to clinging so an alia bhikkhu an alia you may have heard him as a great translator of modern pali mm -hmm. stuff an alia means without clinging and so this notion of alia vignana is this sort of storage of karmic potentiality and underlying cognitive processes that allow conscious experience to happen. We cling to that. We cling to that and, and, and think this is who we are. We are the continuity of our lives. We are the way that we project onto things. This is me and this is mine. And so this notion of a cognitive unconscious is seen to be the locus then of a lot of our problems and uh, both individual and collective, you could say. And this is another reason why the yoga Yogacharans say we really need to delve into the content of, of these, the, these ideas, classifications, behavioral patterns, et cetera, that have been built up over time, because this is where we are non-consciously constructing our worlds and projecting all kinds of crap onto people and things that we don't like, to put it bluntly. Something that became quite precise for me when I was early on studying developmental psychology and then working with Michael Lewis, who is a developmental psychologist at Rutgers, whom we'll be talking to again soon. I've talked to him many, many times, but he makes it clear that between 18 and 24 months, what he calls human consciousness comes into being. Mm -hmm. And he he regards human consciousness as the awareness of awareness. It's the knowledge of knowledge. It's the awareness that I see, hear, and feel, not just seeing, hearing, and feeling. So, you know, infants are born inner uterine even, they can organize a lot of their perceptions pretty well. They can organize, they under, They can hear and discriminate the voice of the mother from other voices. They prefer the language of the mother to other languages. They can test all this now, even inner uterine. And so infants are organized for a lot of perceptions and a lot of emotional interactions with their caregivers, et cetera. But they don't become aware that they do that until they're 18 to 24 months old. And from then on, they start to construct a self essentially something that's in here that's perceiving something out there. He's got lots of research on this. And, and the thing that I think about from a Buddhist perspective is that when we become aware of, uh -huh. this, of this underlying predisposition, let's say series of things that come up and, you know, some of these things you can become aware of in your own history because of your family of origin, you could see the emotional patterns get, you know, repeated. Some things are not that rational. You know, you, you can be repeating things that happened to you that you did not know happened. One of the, the typical thing is, would be like, for example, your, your mother got pregnant out of wedlock, what we call out of wedlock. She got pregnant with you when you, when you, when she was 18. You didn't know anything about that. Maybe, you know, you were even, maybe you didn't even know your mother. And then you get pregnant when you're 18. And then you later find out your mother got pregnant. And, you know, it's like we repeat things that we don't even know about that are that are somehow built into this so-called unconscious mind. Uh -huh. at, this, at the same time, 
this so-called unconscious mind is often very much more conscious than we are because your your dreaming mind, which is really pretty much when this awareness of your awareness shuts down and you're in this world that we call the dream, in that dream, sometimes there's a lot of information that you don't have when you're awake. You know, I mean, just the other day, I had a dream that somebody that hasn't been in touch with me for years had called me up and I could see photographs of things that we had done together when, when my husband was alive and so on. And then I went over and opened my email in the morning and there was an email from him. You know, in other words, this other mind knew that uh -huh. what I didn't know. So, you know, this, I wonder if our conscious mind, which then acts and speaks and does stuff in some way, I, I would like to hear from you. Is it, you know, allowing the Ali Vijnana, which is participating in the background to become enacted in a way right now, you know, like I come into being and I'm riding on, let's say this stream uh, that has, I haven't participated in as far as I know, you know, but it has lots of marks. It has lots of, as you call them, schemas, I would say schemas, or, you know, it has lots of forms in it that motivate. And then I become aware of those and then I do something with them or I'm not aware of them and I just enact them unconsciously and maybe repeat. So, you know, it seems like this aware mind, which the cognitive scientists say it's only around about 5% of the time that we really are aware of what we're doing, you know, and what we're seeing and hearing. They say we're, you know, mostly unconscious from their point of view, what they mean working memory or whatever. But, you know, the in those moments when we are aware, of what we're doing and thinking and seeing. And, and if we direct this wisdom through that, is this other mind also changing from lifetime to lifetime? I mean, what, what's the deal there in terms of the interaction between this aware mind and this other mind that is you know, motivating by its predispositions, a lot of things, including these, you call them runaway associations. How would you say Yogacara and see that? Oh, that's a that's a really good question, and there's a lot of things going on. Certainly, if in the context of of Buddhist cosmology, the universe has no beginning. Beginningless time is how in, in Indians in general, the Hindus also see the world that way. So that beings have been a lot of lifetimes. That's infinite number of lifetimes. So there's a lot of potential karma to come to fruition that we have no that is part of our stream of of kind of individual consciousness, which is constructed by self-grasping, but it has effect, it's efficacious, and that identification. So we have these endless, infinite number of kind of potential karmic fruitions to come about. So there's all kinds of stuff we have no idea what we're doing or why. I mean, that's with, of course, that's the larger framework. One of the, one of the main rationales, and this is a, a a rationale for this notion of why there should be, why we should think in terms of a cognitive unconscious. One of the main rationales is this, that, that, that is talked about, you know, very explicitly and argued for metapsychologically, one could say, in terms of like what's a better way of thinking how all this works, is that, it, that a conscious awareness is simply inadequate for understanding our experience from moment to moment and the continuity of our of our character structures, our personality, et cetera, over time. It's just, it's just not sufficient. And the analogy that they like to use, again, the river analogy, but then they add depth to it. And this shows up at, at uh, in the chapter in the Samdhi Nirmochana Sutra, the sutra explicating the implicit intent of the Buddhist teachings is what it's called, so it's about third century or so. The, the depth of the river is that there are deeper currents going on. And those deeper currents are constantly changing moment to moment like a river is, but they're not changing at the same sort of speed or, or at least so radically as the waves on the surface. The waves on the surface are buffeted by the wind, you know, that you could say of our sensory experiences. And so we have this multi-layered sort of model of how our minds and beings operate with the stream of consciousness, but now with all these different layers going on simultaneously. And that is the way that the Yogacarans, that's their kind of classic model of mind. And the way they start to then address all kinds of other questions about continuity, perception, uh, character traits, et cetera. It's a much 
deeper toolkit to change the <laughs> mixed metaphors, I guess you could say, than what you see in, in preceding forms of uh, uh, Buddhist ideas about how mind operates. What would be the guidance to listeners? If you recognize that you are interacting with this kind of mind, what, what, what can you do to be, let's say, more efficacious or happier or more, you know, something or other, whatever? Well, you know, I mean, be mindful, right? Do, do certain meditative practices in which one observes the arising and falling and passing away of, of these different kinds of patterns that we have, our reaction patterns, our habits, uh, et cetera. And one can, you know, there are a variety of different techniques, I guess you could say, to observe that better. But the general idea is just with, as with other Buddhist schools, is observe what's going on. And, you know, the, the Buddha clearly taught these kinds of things with much the same implications that the that the Yogacharans are, are kind of drawing out, but it, it's less explicit and it's less systematized. So part of what this school is doing is 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 be making things explicit, like explicating the, the intent of the Buddha's teachings. That's the, the translation of this term, Samdhi Nirmochana Sutra, the Yogacara Sutra, and systematizing it in a way that gives, in a sense, meditators better conceptual tools to understand what is going on. And this is where a lot of the debates end up being uh, between later Midyamakans and later Yogacharans. Is talking about a cognitive unconscious a better conceptual tool, or is it just sort of further proliferation and, and inferring things that we don't see directly? And so there's a lot of back and forth, like we saw with Freud and Jung and people saying the unconscious has structure and somebody wants to say, well, show me. I'm sure you've heard this, you know, countless times. Well, I'll just say that I can see the structure of it when I meet with a couple. Yeah. It really, it's like a piece of furniture when you see it, because it's so clear that people are caught in predispositions which are patterned and they have emotional meaning and they're repetitive and the two people are exhausted by yeah. the repetition. And they know this is happening, but they don't know how to stop it. So, you know, it's, it's to my mind, at least my way of thinking, there's no question about the structure and, you know, whether the structures arise from other lifetimes, they will have formed in this lifetime to be repetitive and to be problematic. And people can experience, see, know that they're doing it, but they can't get out of it until they have some insight into, you know, the motivation to create the other person as a thing, as an enemy and to stop doing that. I guess one question I had that, that, uh, relates to, let's say, altered states of consciousness, whether uh -huh. they're generated by psychedelics and uh -huh. DEs. Are there any parallels in descriptions of states experienced by, let's say, advanced practitioners of Yogacara? Are there any corollaries or correlates between, yeah, between experiences that may have been written about by very advanced practitioners that now seem to correlate with people's descriptions of non-dual states of oneness? Uh, there are all kinds of correlates with uh, altered states that we are familiar with from other traditions. Again, with instigated or uh, triggered by various kinds of causes and conditions, you might say. Meditation is, is the sort of intentional cultivation of altered states of consciousness, right? And one can go into really, really deep states of concentration. Again, this is sort of general Buddhist practices of very, very deep states of concentration. And then that allows shamatha or calming is what it's typically uh, classified as. And then that allows like the unwavering candle flame. It allows us to see things very, very clearly and analytically. There's, so there's a whole variety of analytic meditations that are kind of used in conjunction with these concentrative meditations. And that is to analyze and to recognize the constructed nature of all of our experience. And if one goes into that very deeply, it stops being really conceptually analytic and it becomes much more intuitive. And we might say that the bottom drops out. I think that's a good description. And, and the way that the texts talk about it in various ways is there is no center uh, or periphery, right? Everything is equal to space without any kind of center. The bottom just drops away. The bottom of body, grasping onto body, the body of our mind. The, the, and it's just this sort of what they would call a kind of pure consciousness that often has no content. 
and, and uh, mm, go ahead. And and is that in essence um, maybe equivalent to dropping out of space time to transcend it? Well, you know that that's a really good question, and being provoked by you know Donald Hoffman and his use of this term made me realize you know that these are these are the way that he uses that term is very very much comes out of a scientific kind of background. And one of the, the questions before was how is Yogacara different than conscious realism? One of the ways that is very different, of course, is it doesn't use mathematics to get at these insights. The other way that it's very different is that Donald Hoffman is saying that they can use mathematical formulas to talk about what is beyond space and time. You know, at a certain level, I'm just not really sure really what that means. There's a way in which standard Mahayana Buddhists would say that, that reality is ultimately ineffable. That is, ultimately, it is beyond description of any kind. So they would also say it, it, that time and space are descriptors. They agree completely with, with uh, Donald Hoffman on this. They are descriptors, and, and objects that appear to us are like icons in that sense. I, I Instead of saying... A, mere consciousness in my book, I, I put this not just mere mere appearance or mere perception. It's the mere icon theory, Donald Hoffman's mere icon theory. It's just an icon. They would totally agree with that, but they would say, well, you know, the math beyond time and space is is effing it, you know, it's that's you have to get beyond the math, so to speak, because ultimately everything is ineffable. And he sort of said that in his interview. And he said, well, no, there is no never going to be a complete sort of scientific view of the world because any formulation, any theorem, et cetera, has built in assumptions. So he's sort of saying you can't ever actually get away from built in assumptions. So you know, we might say get it beyond time and space, and now we have this this world of intersubjectivity of conscious agents, and then we need to get beyond at some point recognize that even reality can't be ultimately described in terms of conscious agents. It's the same. It's, it's the same uh, as what you said about subjectivity earlier. Uh -huh. That yeah. you know that that yeah. Yogacara gets attacked for making a thing out of the subject. Yeah. Because you know, again, I I think it's very clear with with Don Hoffman. And it was clear for me when I was doing scientific research that science is a way of human beings inter interacting with each other about their differences in a precise way that can, in some ways, avoid destructive conflict if it works. That is, you make a hypothesis, you say, you know, in, and technically it's a null hypothesis. You say, essentially, I'm probably wrong. So disprove me. And so you make this hypothesis, you do an experiment, you report your, this is in the ideal way, you report your results in some mathematical way so that others can test your results. And so then others say, okay, I'm going to test your results and see if I get the same results. And if I do, then you can go on making your hypothesis and we can start to build on it. But if people work over time, and again, in our recent podcast with Don, he, he talks about particularly quantum theory and the remarkable findings of quantum theory. And now quantum theory as a paradigm has to be transcended because the empirical investigations that are going on in the Haldron Collider, I think it's called, uh, the Hebrew yeah, yeah. Collider or something, those uh, can't any longer be done because they risk the collapse into a black hole. And it's very clear to the scientists that if they were to try to investigate smaller and smaller spaces with these huge machines, that they will create a black hole. So they, they've had to stop. And on many, on many fronts, they realize their paradigm. This is where I think it gets confusing when we say beyond space time. It's a paradigm. Yeah. about what is fundamental, that the speed of light is fundamental, that this universe began at some point, that it has a shape. That's the paradigm of space-time that scientists now realize is defunct. It is doomed. And the reason it's doomed is they can no longer investigate it given any kind of empirical investigation. And the mathematics don't work either. So you know, the idea that we're going beyond space-time simply means, uh, you know, that these people that are talking to each other, that are called theoretical physicists or cognitive scientists, that they're investigating paradigms of meaning. 
that no longer take space and time and the speed of light as fundamental. However, again, as Don Hoffman points out, they can't, in their new paradigms, they, those paradigms have to be consistent with what already has been established because of all the levels of agreement, for example, for example, in, you know, in quantum mechanics or in earlier physics as well, classical physics has a lot of work in it from many, 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 many human beings who agreed that this is the paradigm. So you can't just dismiss a paradigm either. This is not deconstruction. You know, this is building on, so science really is a process that's a little bit like meditative inquiry you know, in the sense that it's respectful, it's an investigation of reality. And when done properly, the mathematics are the containers. They, the mathematics contain uh, the individual push and pull on things because uh, as he points out, you know, you, you can't screw around with them too much, although you can in a way with data analysis right now. But I think the idea here is that this kind of investigation that we call science in many ways does bear some rese resemblance to you know an empirical investigation through meditative states not i don't feel it's a one to one but there right. is some resemblance and and so the paradigm of space time is failing and and of course it never really was according to the buddha the the whole story anyway you know the big bang and the speed of light and so on the buddha's going in his uh narrative he goes well beyond that as as the fundamental paradigm so this is, you know, I think very analogous in some ways to these development from earlier Buddhism to Mahayana Buddhism and the, the notion of, of everything being empty of an unchanging essence. And the corollary of that is that it is full of various causes and conditions in patterns of interaction. And we can map out the patterns of interaction in various conventional ways, as long as we recognize that the, that these conventional ways are not making claims about what is ultimately so. And we can think about this as Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics is not falsified by quantum mechanics. Newtonian physics operates, you know, in it's a certain kind of scale. And at other scales, it doesn't. And they're going to sort of basically say, well, now we can see that quantum mechanics does, has its limits as well. And then you know, we're recognizing that even that is something that is, quote unquote, conventional, that it has certain assumptions built in and uh, isn't an ultimate picture, but a very workable picture. And, you know, back to the analogy of destroying Harvard, I mean, if, if the quantum mechanics don't say, well, let's get rid of Newtonian physics, right? I mean, we have, we're zooming, we have computers, we understand electrons and to, to a large degree, it's, you know, it's still, it's still operable. One of the things that strikes me is how many times, back to another point you were making, how many times physicists have admitted after the fact that, that they weren't sure whether or not their experiments were going to create a, a black hole and make a huge hole in our part of the universe? Like, didn't they think they may have asked the rest of us who are living here whether or not we wanted to go on that experiment? They really didn't know, and they'd admit it, you know, in their memoirs. Well, maybe we're the whole, you know, galaxy was going to go to nothing. Well, and it brings up a whole series of paradoxes, doesn't it? How can you destroy the thing that's out there that we can't say anything about and can't prove that it's there? Um, which that's to me, a really, that's a good point. You know, also connects to this another paradox about having yeah. there's there's no unchanging essence, and yet I have karma. Yeah. And on a collective level, what I understood or heard, maybe I interpreted as these habit patterns schemas are like templates much in the same way i guess as the archetypes in jungian psychology uh -huh. are on a collective level right. this projection of our intersubjective reality which takes a appears yeah. as a physical form or a patterned experience uh -huh. and yet we all we all have experienced having a mother we all experience death etc and again this is a series as you step back or shift boundaries, it brings paradox into this in a way which tells me we still have yet to transcend some fundamental misunderstanding of what's going on in our awareness. Like in, in quantum physics, for example, the problem that the physicists have been unable to rec reconcile 
is faster than light communication when particles are entangled and they can right. be separated by enormous distances and yet they appear to communicate to each other instantaneously across vast swaths yeah. of time yeah. or indeterminacy. If we know where a photon or an electron is, we can't know where it's going and how fast it's going or vice versa. If we know where it's going and how fast it's going, we have no idea where it is. So we're moving into, and I think this dovetails with some earlier conversation about uh, what we don't perceive as our own radical act of creativity in every moment of perception. And that perhaps these analytical tools of Yogacara, these mindfulness meditations may allow us to witness as this arises within our own awareness, and then to cultivate the non-grasping to see how as soon as I have this experience, as soon as this thing arises, it's already in a way too late. The paradox is once the experience arises, there are all these other concomitant forces, whether it's karma, however we describe them, that are all interconnected. What I, what I interpret as going on in the scientific paradigms and this shift, which I began with the question about idealism, uh -huh. is the fundamental assumptions behind Western science of a material universe being fundamental and that our consciousness can be found by prodding our brains. As we find out now, we may have this entirely backwards and that consciousness is the fundamental underlying nature of reality. And therefore, we are in one sense, we can say inseparable, even though our perception tells us uh, or tells me I'm isolated and separate in ego in a bag of skin, as Alan Watts has said. And yet we're not just that because there is no indwelling essence. But is there is there a way to unfold this paradox about having no essence and yet having karma yeah i i actually just i don't think of that as as actually a, a paradox but I, I i know that that this is one of the questions that the that buddhists get all the all the time you know if uh karma is about causality really it's about causality at kind of a moral level and an intentional level and it's and, and that is one thing that it kind of brings to the table i guess you could say in terms of discussions with scientists right that that intentionality has a really important causal dimension for our our behavior and and certainly you know psychologists would would totally agree with that in essence in effect you know an unchanging essence is incompatible with a causal view of the world and so the it's there's not a paradox to say that the a person has no essence and yet karma operates because karma is about causality over time and interaction and if there were essences there was no there's no interaction there's no change and so the the genius of of, of Nagarjuna in particular, I think, is to point out exactly that point. If things were truly unchanging, they would not be causally implicated, and therefore we couldn't get a handle on causality whatsoever. So in a certain sense, it's a conceptual dead end, I think, is what he's pointing out. It's just a conceptual non-starter almost, if we if we want to think about causal interactions over time. And so from that point of view, beings are streams. It's the analogy of a stream is, it's not absolute, but it's good. What we don't, what it does not tell us is what are the banks, the riverbed made out of, and why is it that the water doesn't just flow all over the place, right? There are some constraints about the causal effects of our actions where they, occur to a, a similar stream downstream as opposed to other streams all over the place. And I think that's a um, that gets at a lot, of, I think, is a, the confusion and sort of valid criticisms, really, of the no-self theory. It's like, what distinguishes one stream from the next? And the, I haven't looked into this in, in, in great detail because it's it's not often debated about and because most Indians accept rebirth over time, so they don't debate about it to anywhere near they where they debate about other things. But the the general gist of it is grasping. 
identification. What what makes an energy block in a, a sort of at a psychological level? What makes the energy block and not flow well is the grasping, the holding on to the identification to try and 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 nail down a nice a, a telling expression to nail down whether it's actually a cloud or a clown that we're going to bring in, right? So that desire to nail down, to hold on, upadana is, this, is the Sanskrit term for grasping or taking as one's own. That's the energetic nexus that that keeps a, a personality coherent. And they would say even over time, and that can be really made loosey-goosey by all these different deconstructive meditations or drugs. And people can alternatively lose any kind of coherence of their uh, continuity or coherence of their perception and go crazy. Or people can deconstruct all of this stuff intentionally through meditative states and recognize it as a very liberating insight that things only have persistence because we're ongoingly, as you put it, ongoingly constructing them moment to moment to moment, individually and collectively. To all of this kind of precludes the issues about personality. So uh -huh. even, even though there's no essence of poly, there are repetitive habits yeah. in poly's yeah. behaviors, poly's emotions, points of view, and those habits are repetitive and can be traced kind of like you know, it's not exactly the banks of the stream. It's something else that constrains the flowing. And I think it's interactive. I think it's with the others, you know, because much of what I see in my work as a therapist and particularly a couples therapist is what Freud called a repetition compulsion. Right. It is this repeating, 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 and it's typically the projection into the other person and then the desire to control the other person. So it isn't just the desire to grab onto the self. I mean, sometimes I feel in Buddhism, the, the idea of grasping or, you know, the, the idea of this attachment and greed and so on, it's very, very good but it often doesn't include the control of the other person to get your needs met, which is really what humans learn from their infancy. And so, you know, this, this personality of the human uh -huh. has repetitive habits right. that are occurring in their relationships with each other, but also their relationships to all other things in the environment. And those can be traced and known. And at that point, there is some liberation in the sense that then you become intentional, more intentional, okay. like, oh, I know that I could do this or that. And so if I do something that's more liberating, that's that's that goes with the flow of my liberation, that ends up having positive consequences. But I can also do the other thing. And if I do it intentionally, for example, I'm going to go ahead and shout at my partner, even though I know that might be my habit of seeing him doing this thing wrong. So, you know, it's it's something about personality and what psychoanalysts call defenses, the defenses of the ego that leads to a repetition of things over and over again. And um, it's not subtle. That's the thing. I mean, sometimes, you know, it seems like we can lose track of it, but it's so not subtle if you watch yourself or others over time. So, you know, there's... That's where the that's where I would sort of integrate the notion of karma from Buddhism, but I don't think it's well worked out in regard to our relationships with each other. And so that's where I feel that Western psychoanalysis has picked up some of the slack in understanding, you know, how we're predisposed towards each other and to make enemies and so on. So in a sense, I would say it's there's there's not a paradox there. I mean, I don't really exist, but my habits do. And I can change some of my habits. They reoccur. They reoccur. Exist. I'm sorry, that's the wrong word from Yogacara. Just, they, just, I'm, I'm not, not Yogacara. Oh. This is, you know. No, no, no. It, you're, you know, it's a good corrective because they, yeah. they don't, it's they they recur. And honestly, yeah. even for its term, repetition compulsion. Yeah, yeah. It's a great term, you know. We've, and, we've, and, and you know, the term samsara means the going around. Yes, exactly. Oh, and, right. And, right. And, I typically gloss it. That's not a. It's not quite a, a, a translation as compulsive behavioral patterns, and and that be, that's because it works at both the kind of moment to moment and and one lifetime dimension time scale, and it also works over multiple lifetimes. This is it's a compulsive behavioral pattern that we're trapped in.
And so the language of talking about this is the language of dispositions. Yes, yes, dispositions right. and predispositions. And another yeah. way to say it is what goes around comes around. And then when you're thinking about Harvard, if you're going to tear down everything, what goes around comes around, you know? And so it's like what you do does create what's coming around to some extent. I mean, there are many, many factors that are in the mix of things, but a very strong factor really is intentional action. And again, from the, you know, goes around, comes around. So in many, when I said the language is dispositions, I'm, I mean actually the Buddhist language, right? From right. we see this in the early Buddha, Buddhist teachings, early early Pali texts about dispositions, vasana, anushaya. Vasana means sort of it, sometimes it's translated as impressions or in, in impregnations, things, something like that. It has a, to do with scent that lingers, and also anushaya or anusaya, the uh, latent tendencies. And these get systematized in, in the Yogacara schema of a, you know, cognitive unconscious. This is a, the level of disposition is one of the main things that gets, gets systematized there in relationship to conscious awareness. And one of the important parts of, of their way of explaining how intentionality operates is that we have the agency and capacity to self-reflect and to make decisions, conscious decisions. Right. And so we can use that in in relationship to disclosing or understanding more deeply what our dispositions and our patterns are. And that is the the practice on the path. That's that's the whole point of it. And it, it isn't done just just at the non-conscious level and very much is built into intentionality. And the other point is you are really right. It's not simply grasping. It's grasping and, and acting accordingly, right? It's the actions. Karma, the at bottom karma means action. And then it means action as cause and sometimes action as fruition. And sometimes it's the law of cause and effect, et cetera. I mean, it's a term which is kind of used in different parts of the, you know, schema, you could say, cause, result, and the relationship between the two. And karma, ultimately, it's about action. And the, the Indian worldview is that this, the world, as we experience, comes about through action, through karma. And this is just said over and over and over. I, and I have to say that Don Hoffman says that his conscious agents, they perceive, decide, and act. So yes. built into his system, it's yeah. action. Action yeah. is that thing that he's working on in his yeah. interactive network. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's that in that way, there's a lot of similarity with Yogacara. You know, there are differences too, but interesting. So Mike, do you have anything you want to just say? Just last thought about what you just discussed, which is that if the if our karma is this ongoing process of the results of not only our past actions, but all beings' past actions, then in essence, it takes this mindfulness, this approach of mindfulness and practice to be able to stop karma within ourselves. When these actions, we buffet against these actions from the past that ripple in time, it's becoming aware of it and not grasping to be able to approach it maybe with that, with the emptiness uh, that can stop or at least my, in, uh, from an individual approach right. to try to stop or end the influence of that karma to stop perpetuating it and to shift it through even, even my inaction is a new action. Right. It's about breaking this cycle between action, the result and our response to that result, which instigates a new action. And there's three parts to that, and it's breaking the cycle in one place or another. Uh, and breaking mm -hmm. a habitual yes. pattern of perception and action. Well, that is, in a sense, that's what those three are, action result in our response to them that instigates a new action. That's the habitual pattern. And this is the, this is the I think, the fascinating thing about the very notion of pattern. A pattern doesn't exist, it reoccurs. Because it's not in the action, it's not in the result, it's not in the response. It's the it's the thing that occurs in a temporal and interactive way, which means it's not there's no there there, but nevertheless we are bound and committed and torn up by all of these things that, are, that don't even exist. They just reoccur. Well, that's, I think this that's is a... the perfect note to, right. to end <laughs> the conversation. Right. That was thank you so much, and it's really been a pleasure to meet you. Bill. Well, it's been nice meeting you. I'm sorry I didn't get let you talk enough. No, no, no. You're, no, it you're was wonderful. Guest. This is great. Absolutely. It was wonderful, and yeah. and you, you've uh, you've clarified so much. And I'm sure we will ask you back. We're we're in a kind of long conversation here. 
about yeah. waking up. And then what do you do after you wake up is really the idea that waking up is not enough. And uh, we're, we're taking it from many angles, but this has been very, very helpful and clarifying. Yeah. Oh, good. You know, it took me a couple of minutes to get out of my uh, my scholarly lector, lectoral voice and have more conversational. It, it was a great, it's a great voice too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So thank you. And I'll see you soon, Bill. And I'll see you soon too, Mike. Enjoyed this episode of Waking Up Is Not Enough, Flourishing in the Human Space? Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and tap the notification bell so you never miss an episode of insightful discussions and explorations into the human psyche. Share this episode with friends and family to spread the journey of self-awareness and critical thinking. Together, let's challenge the norms, embrace empathy, and flourish in our unique paths. Your support means the world to us and our growing community. Share your comments in the thoughts below. We love hearing from you. The center will be offering a new foundational training in dialogue therapy at the Trapp Family Lodge in Stowe, Vermont. The new sessions are June 27th through 30th, then August 22nd through the 25th, October 31st through November 3rd. Please look at either my website or the Real Dialogue website. Click on to Foundational Training with Polly and have a look at the schedule. We will also be offering free trainings upcoming in various locations in Vermont where we will be teaching the skill of real dialogue. So please join us, become a part of our community, and let us know that you enjoy what we're doing and please contribute. We love to hear from you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Please take a moment right now to go to realdialogue.com and join our membership community. For a short time, we're offering annual and lifetime membership in the Real Dialogue community at a very limited cost. There you have access to countless hours of teachings, interviews, conversations with Polly, Mike, and prominent scientists, sages,